So it's my pleasure now to introduce our first session, which will look at the IAB Europe and Microsoft Advertising Generative AI Research. Um, this is going to be presented by James. Hi, James. How are you doing? Hi. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Really good. Thank you. Looking forward well, to sharing this. We are excited. Excited. This was a, a, an amazing piece of research that we that we did with you guys a couple of months ago, and we've had lots of feedback. I still see it being quoted in different press releases and different industry bylines. So um, it's it's great to have you here to, talking everyone through these results. So James, I'm going to pass over to you. Just make sure you're set up. Perfect. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, so hello everyone, uh, my name is James, I <clears throat> am the uh, product marketing lead for all of our sort of generative AI uh, products and uh, pieces that we do at Microsoft Advertising, and so it's my pleasure to kind of walk you through some of the uh, findings and really set the scene, I think, for what um, you're going to see for some of the exciting content for the rest of the day. Um, so let's start with, you know, this was a piece of research that we undertook uh, in collaboration with the IAB Europe, um, and it came out with some really sort of interesting findings. But uh, I think one of the core things is that um, the level of AI knowledge, although this is something that has really been sort of dominating our industry and dominating the headlines for the last 18 months, when we asked uh, people in the industry uh, to sort of respond in terms of their level of uh, knowledge and un understanding, could they actually define uh, artificial intelligence and give examples of what it looked like um, and how confident they feel to be able to speak about what AI was and its applications? You can see from these numbers that actually the the level of confidence and understanding is, is pretty low. So we're looking at less than uh, sort of 40% uh, of people actually feeling that they can um, define AI properly and tell you uh, sort of examples of AI in action. Um, and one of the other things that we had is sort of the other end of the spectrum is that everybody, you know, pretty much 90% you know, of people almost was saying that training was a key thing that they wanted to see uh, more education, more training on artificial intelligence, particularly from associations like the IAB. And so what I thought I would start with today is, you know, really back to basics and sort of level set us all in terms of um, what is artificial intelligence as we start speaking about it in this new era of generative AI? And to give you some examples, so that at the very least, for people on this call, uh, we can boost those numbers from sort of 38% to 100%. Um, so let's start with a sort of a brief history of AI, because it's something that, you know, although it has been uh, the sort of the buzzword and the thing that everybody wants to hear about over the last 18 months, we've actually had artificial intelligence for decades. And so this was something that started back in the 1950s as a new field of computer science with the goal ultimately to try and create intelligent machines that could replicate uh, or, or sort of um, meet parity with human intelligence. Um, that was something which was the preserve often of sort of a very uh, small handful of uh, computer scientists in a new field in something that was really quite niche. And so fast forward to uh, the late 90s and we got to, uh, I think, the, the birth of more modern AI, which started with machine learning. So as we got to the advances of the internet and we get to really sort of broadband internet and people able to start using uh, these uh, computers at scale, uh, we got a new sort of subset of artificial intelligence, which was uh, called machine learning. And this was um, basically uh, enabling machines to be able to uh, learn from uh, existing structured data sets in order to uh, improve upon that data and be able to make decisions or predictions based on what it could see. Um, but take that forward then another 20 years and we get to 2017 is the sort of the advent of deep learning so this is again like a subset of machine learning and this is a technique in which layers of neural networks are used to process data in order to make decisions the, the key difference here is that whilst machine learning needed still quite a lot of human oversight and a lot of um organizing and structuring of the data initially in order for the machines to be able to learn and make predictions about what it was going to to, to do with deep learning, 
the machines could actually go off and do their own learning uh, in a in an unsupervised manner. And even if the data wasn't particularly structured in a way, it could start to sort of find patterns and bring that together and would um, give you these incredible sort of uh, insights. And then really sort of back end of 2021, and so just really over the last couple of years, we've seen the advent of generative AI. And so this is a new sort of path for us where suddenly um, something that has been in the domain of just a, a, a small handful of experts suddenly became uh, very sort of open and intuitive and usable with features that would allow us to create new uh, pieces of uh, writing and uh, imagery and auditory content given sort of uh, various prompts or, or existing data. And so now I think when we think about AI, we, we kind of broadly split it into two categories, um, sort of predictive AI and generative AI. And so what do we mean by those things? <clears throat> I want to start with predictive. Predictive is um, sort of everything that has come before the sort of the advent of generative AI. And the idea here is that it is great for uh, doing uh, forecasting, analysis, and sort of uh, being able to make recommendations based on what's happened in the past. So it's looking at previous uh, data and, and historical trends to make predictions of what might happen in the future. Um, this has incredible sort of use cases um, and lots of really, really useful uh, outputs. If you think about something that you do in your everyday lives, uh, when we go to a search engine, uh, if you start typing uh, anything into a search engine, the uh, autocomplete function is a great example of uh, predictive AI. Effectively, what it's doing there is it's taking all of the things that people have searched for before, and it's making a prediction or a recommendation that you might find some of these things useful. Uh, so in this case, if I type in, is AI, AI going to dot, 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 the um, predictive AI will then uh, take all of the things that people have searched for before, and we'll make these recommendations based on what it predicts I might want as an outcome. The, if we put that into a sort of thinking about uh, a use case for something in our industry, particularly in sort of digital advertising, uh, automated bidding strategies are something which is uh, a sort of a, a cornerstone of uh, predictive AI. So this is using data and analysis of how your ad campaigns have performed in the past in order to uh, make adjustments and uh, strategies in order to fulfill a particular goal uh, to reach in the future. So whether that is to maximize clicks or to um, hit a certain target CPA or ROAS uh, number, these are all examples of predictive AI uh, being able to uh, use stuff that uh, historical data or things that happened in the past to predict what's going to happen in the future. And of course, <clears throat> so now we're in this new era of generative AI. So this is the ability to be able to start um, creating things from scratch, from a from a simple prompt or from a from an input to generate something completely new. Um, and so this has given us like incredible license to be able to do things that we haven't been able to before. Perhaps one of my favorite examples uh, as a dad of a, a young. A girl who uh, this is Abby. This is my daughter. Uh, Abby's six and is obsessed with all things uh, Disney right now. We're going through an Encanto phase, and uh, all she wants to do is to look like her favorite uh, Disney characters. And so, as somebody who doesn't have uh, a lot of artistic skills, that has something been you know to make her look like Mirabelle from Encanto. That's quite hard for me to do. But suddenly, with generative AI, I can put a quick prompt and I can uh, sort of use her photo as a uh, image source. And on the right there, you can see that's the AI's interpretation of what she would look like if she wanted to be uh, Mirabelle. Again, sort of thinking about a more sort of work-related example for digital advertising, the um, explosion of interest that we've seen in generative AI is sort of starting to come up with new use cases of how we might uh, start to use these technologies in order to make our lives easier uh, when it comes to things like campaign creation or uh, you know things that previously have taken us a long time, like uh, writing copy for ads. And so here you can uh, literally sort of type in a prompt into 
uh, at all and say, can you help me sort of promote our spring sale all terrain uh, bicycles in this case? And it will come up with uh, suggestions of headlines that you can start to pull into your ads uh, straight away. And so you don't have to think of all of the good creative ideas. Now you can have a sort of a goal in mind or something that you want to achieve and AI can help you in order to sort of get through those things. And so we want to dive a little bit into the research specifically now. And so um, when we looked at uh, sort of how would uh, we ask people to describe their current uses of artificial intelligence, I think one of the things that we have seen very rapidly, given that this is still relatively, you know, at the beginning of the journey of AI, is that already 38% of people said that it is becoming embedded into their daily work lives. I think perhaps more importantly is that if you look across having um, you know, truly sort of embraced it to occasionally using it and then experimented with it, 91% of this industry have either sort of fully jumped in or have at least experimented with generative AI. So this is not something that is going to go away. This is something that is really starting to become the future of how we think about our work. And then, you know, why has there been such take up and such advocacy of these things? I think it's because we can see so many different problems and use cases that can potentially be helped or solved using these tools. And so the vast array of what is possible is, is quite uh, astonishing. So whether it's developing content or creating new creatives, building business cases, um, whether it's coding or strategizing, all of these things are kind of coming through as good use cases of how um, people are starting to use this. And I think the key thing to highlight here is it is not just, you know, a simple case of how can you literally make me better at my uh, job as a marketer? Like, how can you help me build better ads or, you know, make my ads more efficient? It's also the sort of the bit behind the work that you do, whether it is developing your strategy for the future or thinking about the sort of the business case or maybe uh, pitching for a new uh, piece of business. These things can all be incrementally helpful and useful using generative AI. And then the, the sort of the why is important as well. What are some of the reasons why people are looking to adopt uh, these new technologies? And um, top of the list, perhaps unsurprisingly, is operational efficiencies. So people see this as a way to save time, to become more efficient, to operate, um, to optimize the way that they're doing things and to take time back, particularly for people when we know we're all busy, we're all overworked, <clears throat> and the demands keep growing, this is seen as being a sort of helpful tool to assist with some of those operational efficiencies. Um, but also, uh, you know, people increasingly are seeing this as a way to gain a competitive advantage. So particularly when there is um, a degree of uncertainty in the industry and people not sure whether they should leap you know, fully into uh, embracing these tools, those that are willing to do so are seeing this as a way to sort of get ahead of the competition. Um, so those slides that I have shown so far as part of the uh, joint research that Microsoft and the IAB Europe have done together, but this is a, a now a slightly um, a complementary study which Microsoft undertakes uh, every year, which we call the um, Work Trend Index. And so, one of the things that I think is important to address is some of the sort of the elephants in the room in terms of concerns with also how this technology is uh, making a difference. So um, one of the big concerns is that, you know, my organization doesn't necessarily support us to use AI tools. And so one of the things that we see is that, you know, 78% of people are using uh, their own AI tools and kind of bringing them to work, whether sort of work has uh, kind of officially sanction them or not and so this is I think is a, an important reality for businesses and brands to, to be aware of is that people are going to be using these tools whether you uh, sort of um, officially put them forward or not and it's far better to actually get ahead of that and to sort of set um, boundaries but also best practices with your workforce in order to make sure that you're meeting their needs. Um, two of the other things that I think are important that come out of this is that uh, over half of the people interviewed as part of the Work Trend Index said that they were um, reluctant to admit that they were using AI for some of their most important tasks. 
And then when we dig a little bit more into that, one of the reasons for that is that they see that um, of people who are using AI at work, they worry that uh, it's gonna make them look replaceable. And so, you know, I think to kind of round this off, I think this kind of thinking creates a potential where we start to separate ourselves and start to think of this is me versus AI, me versus the machine, and it becomes a competition. What is it that I can do uh, that is uniquely human that a machine can't compete with. Um, however, you know we're seeing that for those that can actually embrace this technology, there's a much better way forward, which is me plus AI. The goal is not, you know, how can AI replace human capability? It's how can it augment and sort of add to human capability in order to make us all better. And so I just wanted to kind of highlight a few things that, you know, you might want to do that you could uh, use as sort of use cases. So being able to um, rewrite a product summary, some uh, many of us who have to work, you know, maybe with engineers often get very dense material back uh, that's very difficult to understand. What about um, using AI to translate that so that someone with the reading age of a 12 year old could actually understand it? Um, how about changing the tone of an email? You know, how many times do you think about writing an email for your company? And then uh, even if it's just internally, like, am I uh, going to broach this in the right way that people will uh, understand uh, an empathetic tone? Um, building SWOT analysis, something that might have taken ages before is now something that you can literally type in with a quick prompt at the, at the touch of a button. Um, and how about this? You know, something which is a really nuanced and deep uh, question in this case uh, for the car insurance industry uh, what are the top three customer challenges across car insurance that make a customer feel unsafe when buying a product and how could a company advertise a solution that would instill the feeling of safety in order to inspire them to buy that product give three adjectives for each of these challenges that could be used in advertising and just to show you that this is not a hypothetical i literally sort of type that into into copilot into microsoft's a generative AI tool, and this is what it came up with. So it's identified those problems in terms of lack of trust and empathy, and then given those adjectives. So if customers feel that insurance don't have their best interests at heart, why not use trustworthy, empathetic, reliable? If there's a poor customer experience, try intuitive, personalized, and user-friendly. And with shifting expectations in this field, try innovative, adaptable, and customer-centric. So I've gone through very quickly some of the research and some of the things There's clearly much more behind this. But I think the sort of the key takeaway is one is that generative AI sort of moves us from this predictive analysis to being able to augment creativity and productivity. Uh, the second thing is that 91% of the people in this industry have used or experimented with generative AI, and it's increasingly going to become part of our daily lives. And the final thing is that, you know, it Critically, it is me plus AI, not me versus AI. This technology is here to amplify your capabilities, not to replace them. If you want to find out more, you can download the research here. The QR code is here, or you can go to the IAB Europe website uh, and you can find out a lot more. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim.